Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Baltazar. And it's everyone's favorite week when it comes to K-State football in one of the most storied and historied rivalries in all of college football, and that is the Sunflower Showdown. K-State up against KU, this time another edition in Manhattan, Kansas, looking to get the streak up to driving age in Kansas, up to looking to get it to 16 years. And before we go in and talk more about the team that K-State's going up against, do want to thank the sponsors of the show. That is Greg, Arthur, and Grandma. Thank, thank you, you, Grandma. Grandma. And if you want to support the show financially and have your name right out at the beginning of every single episode, please be sure to check out the supporters link, both found in our podcast and Twitter bio. But let's talk, let's talk KU, shall we? And this is a, as much as I am and really want to bully this team, this is a team that is in all likelihood better than their two and five record. How much better? I'll leave that to your interpretation, but I will say, in my opinion, not too much better, but the two wins that they've picked up this year is they molly whopped Lyndon Wood, who is one of the worst FCS teams in the country, and then destroyed Houston in their most recent game. So their first and their most recent game were their only victories. And if Houston is truly the way that they are, up against KU, which they, they, they certainly seem to be. That's not a particularly impressive victory. And I, I want to give a little bit of credit to KU because some of their losses don't look as bad as, as they originally did. I mean, Illinois and UNLV are both legitimately good losses. At West Virginia, eh, at quote-unquote home, up against TCU, yeah, that's a bad one. But losing at Arizona State, that's not a bad loss either. So, and, and all of those games were blown fourth quarter leads. <laughs> so, I really do, as much as I am willing to and am going to make fun of this team, I truly think that this is a team that is better than their record. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um because, I mean, like, like we all love to, like, poke fun at KU whenever they blow fourth quarter leads uh, because, I mean, it just it makes the record look worse. Uh, it's a punch in the gut for our rivals. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, we can't necessarily forget that they were in those games uh, when it comes to evaluating them. Um, I mean, sure, they had to really kind of go out of their way to lose most of these games, uh, particularly West Virginia, I would say, um, is, a, is a pretty big uh, – um, um, screw job that they did. Um, but um, those are still games that they were leading late. Um, and even some of them against some quality opponents like Arizona State, they probably should have won that game. And Arizona State's been, by all intents and purposes, a pretty good team this year. Uh, so, I mean, this KU team, I'm clearly not as good as they were hoping for, regardless of your stance on moral victories or not. You know, like, like they are still not reaching the level of play uh, that they were expecting or wanting uh, from this group. But it uh, doesn't mean their season is dead. It uh, doesn't mean they have nothing to play for either. I mean, if uh, they can still lose another game and make a bowl game, uh, they with APR, they might even be able to lose two and make a bowl game. Um, and they, and they have a lot to play for otherwise, particularly in this game. I mean, the, this is a, a huge game uh, for the state rivalry. Uh, so it's uh, like we can't just count teams out, uh, particularly when we're having a good season. I mean, it's very easy to overlook teams. Uh, and, uh, we absolutely cannot afford to do so because the margin of error is not good. Despite again, the two and five record for KU, they're, they're a better team than a two and five record. And I, I think we're probably aware of that. Because it seems like Kleiman and Leipold have a lot of mutual respect. Uh, so I don't think Kleiman uh, would go in with the intent of disrespecting Leipold by not preparing it adequately. And I think he also understands the importance of the game um, to the fan base and to perception of the program. Yeah. And 
this is one of those games where you know for a fact that K State is going to get KU's best look because I I don't want to say that they're not playing for anything because they theoretically could get to a bowl game. However, they have a ridiculously difficult path to do so because they play us, Iowa State, BYU, Colorado, and then I don't even remember who their last game is, but the odds of them surviving those four games are very low. Last game is Baylor, uh, for what it's worth. So that's actually a gettable game. Yeah. That, Although it is, on the road. it is on the road, though, and they've really had some tough luck on the road. Yeah. But th- this is the game that, I mean, it's your main rival. Every single year you end up circling it. And I have a feeling that KU especially – has ended up circling this game as they've done for the past 15 years because K State has been so dominant in that time frame. But I, I don't think that this is the best KU team that K State has seen. I honestly think that the 2021 team was probably the best, followed by no, 22 and then 23 is probably their best two teams. But Connor, you can take the first two little points here about their their offense, which is where we're going to start. Yeah. Um, as uh, If you've been listening to this podcast, uh, you've uh, probably heard us, or maybe more specifically Ace, talk about uh, who they lost um, as the offensive coordinator, which makes Ace very happy because now he can watch a successful Andy Katalniki offense uh, <laughs> without having to also see a BKU. Uh, KU – um, their office coordinator, Andy Katelmicki, who had been at Lance Leipold for, uh, I think, over a decade. Uh, he uh, um, left and went to be the offensive coordinator at Penn State, uh, who's now number two in the country, and he's making Drew Aller look very competent and is doing some absolutely absurd stuff <laughs> up in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is not the same motion-based um, scheme everybody open uh uh, Dairy Queen Blizzard offense, as <laughs> uh, would put it, uh, um, that it was before. Um, they replaced Katelmicki with Jeff Grimes, uh, who was Baylor's offensive coordinator. He was let go after last season, um, and it was a bit of a surprising hire, honestly, because uh, Grimes was uh, he was the fall guy for Baylor's worst unit, um, or at least maybe most underperforming unit. Um, and he really didn't have a great reputation as a play caller um, at Baylor. Um, I know that it's been said that uh, he was brought in not to run his own offense, but to run Katelniki's offense. Uh, but if he is, it looks a lot different, and the sequencing is not the same. Uh, that That's for sure. Um, but um, they, they've got Grimes now uh, instead of Katelniki, uh, which just objectively speaking um, is – a massive downgrade. Like I, I don't think they could have downgraded much more, honestly, at offensive coordinator. I guess like he was really uh, just brilliant. Uh, but they're still a more multiple team than they might get credit for. Mostly operating out of pistol with different personnel groupings, um, and they're at the very least trying to keep people guessing. Um, and so there's still some elements of what Katonaki was trying to do, albeit in a much more watered down fashion. I, I think that's a, that's a very, very good way of putting it is it's, it's what happens if you take a husk of like, you basically take the soul and the intelligence out of a Katonaki offense and instead put in the Baylor offense, which if that sounds like an insult, it is because I, Katelniki is a special play caller with just how he implemented motions into making life so simple for the quarterback. I mean, there's a reason why the the blizzard analogy worked so well because, you know, it's simple stuff, but just mixed in with your favorite candy. So Katelniki is so advanced in how he used and uses motion and gadget plays that Jeff Grimes just isn't he doesn't have that same gadget play motion based mindset to make the offense as simple as possible for the quarterback but that that doesn't mean that okay that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad offensive coordinator he's a bad offensive coordinator because he's a bad offensive coordinator who can't 
who hasn't really found his own identity that it, that he can follow with him, not because he's trying to imitate someone else. But this is still an offense that can almost succeed in spite of the play calling, despite the performances that they put up at the beginning of the year, where Jeff Grimes himself said, don't watch the Illinois film because th- it was bad enough to not even be worth watching which if you ever say that to your players as a coach, you may as well just walk into the nearest body of water never to return because that is abysmal. <laughs> yeah, which to be fair, I wouldn't really want to watch it either if I were in their position, but you got to do it to learn. But uh, no, it was a uh, uh, an absolute disaster class um, yes. uh, for performance at Illinois game. Also, there's a typo in the next point. That's not supposed to be run. That's supposed to be pass. Fair enough. <laughs> they pass the ball forty-four uh, percent of the time, uh, and a lot of that uh, in the running game. In the in the running game is zone running. Okay, a lot of that is zone running, which they've meant to put a lot. How about you just read this because you know what it's supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, it they their running team basically is is what it boils down to and the majority of their runs are zone runs which again follow jeff grimes from baylor which is weird because it wasn't something that he did a a whole whole lot of at byu when he was there with the zach wilson team but I, i think that he just sort of adopted the wide zone zone running offense that baylor and aranda really really like running Because to be fair, it normally is a pretty consistent scheme. I mean, there's a reason why I think at this point, two thirds of the NFL have coaches from the Shanahan, McVay, and the floor trees that all use the wide zone running play. And it it's the the downside with it is that you're putting a lot on your running backs. This is a running back room, and so is the running back room at Baylor that could handle that stress in the running game. So you may be asking yourself, well, why aren't those offenses at, why hasn't the Grimes offense been successful at Baylor and KU? Well, the simple reason is, is that you need something to complement the zone running with. There was a time where I think it was McVeigh for as much as he was running inside zone, he was running an equal amount of like counter and, you know, trap plays you need something else to complement it. You can't run that exact same concept over and over again. It can be your main concept, but it can't be your only concept. That's the problem that Mizzou had has. <laughs> and their entire running game is wide zone. So yeah, it, they have a running back room that handles their scheme, but the scheme itself is kind of deficient. <laughs> Yeah, um, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm, at the end of the day, like Grimes just is not as good of a play caller um, as Katomiki, nor as good a uh, designer of offense. Um, and and no matter how good your running backs are, if there's not some variance in what you're doing on the running game, then you're just going to struggle uh, a little bit more. Like even if you have a guy like Devin Neal, who is a fantastic running back, uh, Daniel Hyshaw, who is uh, probably a starting running back at a lot of other power four schools. So yeah, he's also questionable for this game. Yeah. He's been battling injuries pretty much the entire season, uh, which I suppose isn't a new thing. Cause he, I think at one point missed a whole year, but I digress. Uh, but despite the constant bullying that this team faces, uh, they're, they're very good team. The percentages uh, they convert. They convert fifty percent of their third downs. And they have scored on every single red zone possession that they've had this year, with eighty percent of those being touchdowns. Uh, they're, however, they're not the best at getting to the red zone. Uh, so they're sustaining drives once they get rolling, but the problem is getting uh, to the uh, the red zone. I mean, they only have twenty four trips to the red zone on the year. Uh, you compare that with UNLV. UNLV has forty two trips to the red zone, uh, which by my calculations is a lot more than 24. <laughs> so, and, and being fair to KU, K-State is actually pretty similar in number. K-State has 26, 
the leader in the country, the only reason I put UNLV is because KU's played UNLV. The leader in the country, I think, either has 44 or 46 red zone attempts. So K-State and KU are comparable in how they, like, their red zone percentages or how many trips that they've had. But it's just that KU has had a little bit more issue in terms of general explosiveness. But as soon as they get into the red zone, the the scheme really, really does work to the benefit. And that's probably the biggest ad, advantage when it comes to the, the Jeff Grimes offense. Is it as good as Andy Katelniki's in the red zone? Still, the answer is no. But it's still a solid enough scheme whenever you get basically from either side of the 20s, it's a good scheme. It's everything else in between that needs work. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, in the passing game, they run play action about 33% of the time, and they run the more typical play action stuff that you're going to see from more pro-style offenses. Uh, they work the middle a lot on crossers and digs, and they have a very high deep ball percentage uh, sitting at about 20%. Uh, which again is a shockingly high number, um, but they they love um, that offense loves a play action post. They absolutely love it. that that's kind of been their money play honestly this year. When they're looking for an explosive play, that's what they go to. Unless it's Devin Neal just kind of divining uh, something. Yeah, and the it being a, a play action based offense really does. It, it's sort of meant to anyone that's playing zone is going to be terrified because that's if you're playing man coverage, you're not looking back at the quarterback. So the play action fake probably isn't going to do all that much, but unless uh, well safeties, but that's more in the margins and it's still slightly helpful there. But this is, it's very different from the Katelniki offense. We keep saying it. We're going to keep saying it because it's a point that can't be stressed enough. This is an offense that wants to run wide zone, run wide zone, and then depending on where they're at, they want to try and bomb you deep with play action. Or they want to try and get iso balls outside to their receivers, which credit where credit is due, we will talk about their receiver room, but it is a very, very talented group. And I feel like that's as good a transition as any to talking about the notable offensive players to, and, and I'm actually, I'm just going to let you read the notes before I become really, really annoying after you read the notes. <laughs> Very well. Now the first notable player is Jalen Daniels at quarterback. Um, it's very easy to bully uh, JD for um, being injured kind of perpetually uh, and also having a wildly disappointing season, uh, but he's not a bad quarterback. Uh, and he's not close to the bottom of the Big 12. Um, but he does have a fatal flaw, and that is he is so used to Andy Katelniki scheming that his growth has kind of been stunted. Uh, he's a one-read quarterback that has a ton of trust uh, in his receivers to make a play. Uh, his turnover-worthy throw percentage sits at about 5%, uh, which is not very good when you have a completion percentage in the 50s. Uh, so he's definitely mistake prone, not a bad quarterback, but he is far from being a good quarterback. Yeah. I, I think the best way to describe Jalen Daniels is mediocre or mid, which, you know, if only someone could have projected this happening several years ago, you know, if, if, if only someone could have, projected this outcome <laughs> it, it really was an unexpected outcome that no one saw coming but at, as like i said as easy as it is to sort of dogpile on jalen daniels you know 10 touchdowns to eight interceptions if you take out the games up against teams and you only count the ones against teams that have a heartbeat he's i believe it's six and seven touchdowns to interceptions his completion percentage and QBR both go down and his completion percentage already isn't great. But despite all of this, he is a better quarterback than pretty much any of the 18 year olds that have been trotted out in the big 12 this season. And also Alan Bowman. 
So you may be saying the bar is the floor. I still say that he clears the bar. The biggest thing with Jalen Daniels is a mixture of trust in his receivers and residual trust in the scheme where if he gets told, Hey, this is your primary read. Damn it. He's throwing the primary read and there is nothing that's going to stop him from doing that. And there, so you can't say he's not coachable. However, you can say that he is perhaps too coachable in that he is either running or throwing that damn deep post. (laughs) So again, is he a bad quarterback? No, he's just, painfully painfully mediocre which to be frank is kind of what he's always been it's just that he had probably the best offensive coordinator in the country to cover it up so is he a threat to k-state yes and he still can run the ball and he still has even better this is where hands up this is one thing i got wrong in the original andy katelniki video that i made his arm strength is better than i gave him credit for because he he can throw the he can push the ball downfield with some pretty good velocity. So hand up, that's one thing that I didn't give him enough credit for. Uh, but he's still just kind of okay, and he needs to not just be okay in this game. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. Uh, but somebody that has uh, not really uh, been as uh, volatile as Jalen Daniels as their running back, Devin Neal. Uh, He is the lone in-state standout on this KU team, Uh, being a a, a Lawrence High grad, and he uh, ends up staying home uh, with KU. He was very briefly on their baseball team as well, but that didn't really end up going anywhere. Um, But he cemented himself as one of the most consistent running backs in the Big 12 and he has a really great uh, blend of vision, twitch, and speed uh, that makes him a genuine threat on any given running play. And he does all of that um, while uh, um, being a pretty good size as well. Uh, you know, you hear all that and you think that maybe he's not that big at least, but now he's uh, 5'11", 215 pounds, uh, which is shorter than DJ Giddens. That's about how much DJ Giddens weighs. Uh, so Devin Neal is a supremely talented running back uh, for KU. Yeah, he's probably a a Jayhawks Hall of Fame guy, honestly. I think he secured that legacy already. I'm pretty sure he's like 75 yards away from uh, KU's all-time rushing record as well. And he 100% deserves it because Devin Neal is and has been a stud for this team ever since he showed up on campus. And he's one of those rare backs that just doesn't really have much in the way of weakness. And he's also very clearly loyal to the team because he could have left several years ago and he would have been a draftable running back. And even with the amount of tread on his tires, he's probably still worth picking up as a late round pick in the NFL draft. And he probably will be just because backs that are as well-rounded as he is, even if they have taken a lot of carries and taken a lot in terms of hits in college, like they're still in very high demand, especially as late round picks. So Devin Neal has been an NFL guy, like a, a borderline lock in the NFL for the past three years. That hasn't changed. Devin Neal is still one of the top backs in the Big 12, and he had and has, I guess, a quality running mate in Daniel Hyshaw, but he's questionable because he fights injury. But Daniel Hyshaw is much more of a, a bruising back, which is pretty much the that's that's his main compliment to Devin Neal is Hyshaw is a bigger bruiser than Neal is. Yeah, and once you get past Hyshaw, the uh, the carries really go down. Uh, other than Jalen Daniels, of course, but I mean Devin Neal has 117 carries this year. Hyshaw has 50. It'd probably be more if he was healthier. Uh, but the next running back, uh, Sevian Morrison, with nine. Uh, so uh, they are really sticking with uh, those two main guys. And if high Shaw is questionable or limited, it's going to be a lot of Devin Neal all night. Uh, and I doubt we see very much of anybody else uh, unless they're trying to throw in some wrinkles, uh, which again, last year they threw in 
more wrinkles than I thought possible. Uh, and uh, they um, still came up short, but they likely have some special stuff planned again. But that takes us out of the running backs into the remaining notable players, uh, which is um, all of their receivers. Uh, the, the reason that we say all their receivers is because uh, they all kind of blend together. They have very similar skill sets. I don't mean that in a way to generalize or minimize them. They're all very good, uh, but they're just similar. Uh, they're deep threat receivers uh, who are big and have very good contested catch skills, uh, but they sometimes struggle a bit separating laterally, uh, which is another reason why KU's offense is so vertical. Uh, the receivers um, have some trouble being true separators, but they can rely on one-on-one -on -one contested catch situations. Uh, if there's anybody on their team that is good at separating laterally, it's definitely Luke Grimm. Uh, he's also, by complete coincidence, the smallest of their starting receivers at um, six foot. Um, but uh, they're very good in these contested catch situations, uh, and they cannot be taken lightly, especially given K-State's uh, – spotty secondary uh throughout this season yeah and what this wide receiver room lacks in terms of you know true star power they don't have a travis hunter and they don't have a tech mcmillan very few teams do but outside of the top guys this is probably the second most talented wide receiver room that k-state has seen this year outside of Colorado, because Colorado just randomly spawns a bunch of receivers that are able to separate and still somehow have contested catch ability. But Luke Grimm is a really, really reliable option leading the team in receptions. And then Lawrence Arnold and Quentin Skinner both have more speed than I think they're given credit for. And if you're someone who is 6'3 plus and you have speed, you just need to have a contested catch percentage of like 30% and you're instantly playable in any power four roster. And Lawrence Arnold and Quentin Skinner are better than that. So there is, there, there is a, a concern that especially given K-State secondary are stars, two relatively undersized corners at I think it's five, 10 and six, one are the starting corners. That sounds about right. I think Garber, he's like six one or six foot. But they're they're going to be able to sort of outsize us in terms of catch radius on the outside with their receivers. And that's something that they've been able to do for the past few years in case states handled it fine. But again, that's with secondaries that have been playing a little bit better than K State's current secondary. So to, to, for a sort of TLDR on their offense, individual pieces, pretty solid. They, they range from okay to really good. It's just the scheming is just not there. And some of it could be growing pains, moving to a new scheme. And the other part of it could be they're running an off. They're asking someone to run someone else's offense. It'd be like asking, I don't know, Mike Leach to run a triple option team. It's not going to work. <laughs> like the, the, Those two things just don't mix. So their, their offense has a bit of an identity crisis, but despite that, they're still, they still have individual talent that is worth worrying about. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, I mean, even if the scheme is uh, different and maybe not um, as elite as it was last year, the, all the pieces uh, at the skill positions are still there. Uh, save for, I guess, Jason Bean, who was the quarterback most of the year. But Daniels still had plenty of experience in that offense. Neil has been there as long as anybody, and those three receivers have become super reliable. Uh, and uh, Luke Grimm, Lawrence Arnold, and Quentin Skinner. Um, I, I guess uh, at least they don't have uh, Mason Fairchild to get <laughs> wide open as the slowest tight end of all time. <laughs> Because uh, that was always frustrating, but Jared Casey's still here. That is true. Jared Casey is still um, at, at KU. I think he slimmed down a little bit this offseason as well. Uh, he's more of a, a true tight end at this point, uh, which is a little surprising. But only nine catches on the year uh, for Casey, which I think is at least feels lower. 
uh, than I have been. Uh, but, so you wonder why it's because Andy Katelniki decided that, you know, he's not there to just give a guy the ball to prove a point that he could give it to anyone. <laughs> it, it definitely proved that point though. Um, <laughs> Katelniki made his point, uh, but that can take us into the defense uh, and their scheming. Uh, they are one of the rare teams uh, that are stubbornly sticking to a base four two. And they're not basing in a hybrid front or a 3 3. Uh, so it's not a look that we've seen a lot of uh, this past year, other than when Colorado uh, switched to 4 2 to try and stop the run against us uh, back in Boulder. Uh, so um, a little bit of a different front, but not necessarily different in like a, a sense that we've like never seen anything like it before. I mean, this, this isn't an abnormal defense to run, it's just a little interesting. Uh, that they haven't gone with the trends. Yeah, it, especially given that, you know, even teams that are that want to stick to more of a 4-2, they have moved to like more of a 2-4 hybrid where they just have guys that are also able to drop out as edge players. No, this is, this is a team that still very much prefers four down linemen in an over front, which it, it's rarer and rarer that you see that now. And it, I mean, it's, it's not a deficient defensive scheme in theory. It just, it has its own set of weaknesses where, you know, full disclosure, I, if I were a college defensive coordinator, firstly, I'd probably be at the D three level because defense is not my thing, but I'd probably still base four, two. I just wouldn't base four, two in the way that they do where it's, basically the same front every time with very little in the way of variation. Yeah, definitely an interesting choice to uh, um, kind of show the same look every single time. Um, but uh, I can take us into some of their uh, um, details and percentages. Um, out in third down, uh, they are among the worst in the country, uh, giving up conversions 41% of the time uh, as a defense. Uh, which um, not very good, um, but somehow they're a touch better in the res in the red zone uh, with a only 78% scoring rate and a 48% touchdown rate. So they kind of have some sort of bend don't break deal uh, going on, uh, particularly with the four two five seems maybe a bit reminiscent of some of those uh, Snyder 2.0 defenses, maybe a little better at forcing turnovers. Yeah, their their primary goal is bend don't break but also try to get high volumes of turnovers by forcing mistakes not necessarily with pressure because they're not a particularly great pressure team but they they do have you know again another part where i'm going to give them a lot of credit they do have a talented defensive backfield and i think that's why they're willing to play that 425 and they're just willing to have that third safety that you would see otherwise in a three, three, five, they're willing, they're just more willing to let him kind of play wherever he feels he needs to. And in this defense, that's probably OJ Burroughs, but he's just kind of okay. He's no Kenny Logan, I think is the best way to put it because very few players were, but yeah, Ben don't break, which is weird given the next point. <laughs> Yeah, um, in terms of their coverage, they're very multiple. Uh, they do, however, have a slight preference for man coverage, but they will throw all sorts of looks at you uh, on the back end. That's probably a, a product of having a lot of experience uh, in the secondary, but it isn't necessarily um, consistent uh, with a bend, don't break philosophy. So maybe the numbers are just lucky right now. Uh, in terms of their red zone percentages, maybe it's not a philosophy thing, uh, but those two things don't necessarily line up. Yeah, because if, if you're running a bend, don't break defense, you really expect a lot of, you know, too high quarters or, you know, just sort of off coverage. No, they'll, they'll play press. They'll, they'll get in your face. They'll play man coverage. They'll play single high cover three. They, they'll play just about everything. And, I think that may contribute to them being kind of bad on third down because they're doing the jack of all trades, master of none philosophy. 
it just so happens that they're having it work out in the red zone because I think they're switching to the more traditional red zone of, oh, wait, we kind of have to play man coverage. (laughs) But yeah, it's interesting in how they play their defense. And I don't mean interesting in the way of like, huh, I, this would be something interesting to do a film breakdown on. It's, it's interesting in the, huh, that's kind of weird way. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Which I guess uh, maybe is a bit of a product of, uh, um, tell me he's the highlight loss for their staff, but I know that they lost their, uh, I think it's their secondary or defensive backs coach. Uh, He and he was uh, really highly thought of uh, as well. I think was one considered one of the top recruiters on staff. I think he's at A and M now, uh, so I'm a pretty significant loss there. Um, but moving on to the next point uh, with um, the KU defense, uh, is their biggest problem is that they really struggle to get pressure uh, without blitzing. Uh, a lot of their sack production this year comes from a linebacker who gets schemed open on blitzes and their D line is just not great at winning one-on-one matchups in either the pass or the run games. Uh, Their team only has 16 sacks on the year and only nine and a half of those come from the defensive line. And even fewer are against uh, some of their more quality opponents. Uh, So it's been a bit of a struggle to create pressure, which in today's day and age in college football is becoming more and more important with uh, quarterbacks getting more accurate as passers. Yeah, so of of their four main pass rushers, as in people that have the most pass rushing snaps, they none of them average above a 68 PFF grade. They are all either bang average or below average. And also, none of them have a win rate above 9%, which is bad. <laughs> that is really bad. <laughs> I... You, you want your win rate to be somewhere in the realm of 15, 20% is where you're getting pretty solid. Not great, but solid. If you're struggling to crack 9%, there, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. And in terms of pass rush win rate, that honor belongs to someone that we'll talk about later. But he's a linebacker who's just really, really good at blitzing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, which uh, speaking of some notable players, that's a great time for us to move into talking about uh, some of their most notable players on defense. Uh, And we'll start with the guy that um, is maybe the most widely known KU defender, but he may not be the best corner on this team. Uh, And that's Kobe Bryant. Uh, While he is one of the most overrated corners in the country, you don't get any kind of national respect if you don't have at least some talent. He's a very naturally athletic and gifted cornerback, uh, but um, he is very good with recovery speed uh, and finding the ball, baiting picks. But the flip side is that he's very grabby um, and he gives up a lot of risky ground uh, and coverage. Uh, But he has some of those qualities that you just kind of deal with it on the KU end. Uh, And he's also a very willing run defender, which, uh, again, that makes him a very valuable corner. Uh, And, again, when we say overrated, that doesn't mean he's a bad cornerback. Uh, It just means that he's kind of widely considered to be elite when I think we'd maybe more uh, draw him up to be a good to very good corner. Uh, And some of it does come from the fact that he is really grabby um, and he has a tendency to kind of get dusted because he's – always looking for the pick uh, that that he's a very interception minded DB, which is a dangerous game to play. Yeah. Uh, for reference, Kobe Bryant has been penalized four times in, in pass plays and coverage. No one else on the team has more than one. And I don't think anyone else on K state has more than two. So Kobe Bryant, again, solid corner who's, He kind of plays corner with the playmaker mentality, which is very similar to Trayvon Diggs in the NFL. And Trayvon Diggs very nearly set the interceptions record as like a second year player, only to get beat by someone who's actually just better in coverage, but just so happens to get picks too. 
Kobe Bryant is more than willing to play the dangerous game of I'll give you this little bit of wiggle room, but then I'm going to try and grab your arm to limit you. So that way it's easier for me to get the pick. So it's a mixture of him and he's clever about it. He's not an idiot about it. If he was an idiot about it, he would be penalized much more than four times. He's much more subtle with it than probably it makes it seem. But he also just has the recovery speed to make it look like he's getting away with it. So Kobe Bryant is a playmaker at corner, but not necessarily the greatest in terms of pure coverage. And that's why we say that he's probably not the best corner on the team, which is so weird going from perhaps one of the most overrated defensive backs to somehow one of the most underrated. Yeah. This next corner that we get into is Mello Dotson. Uh, of the two corners that KU is running, uh, he's a more traditional sticky corner that does not give up much in the way of ground. He's a really, really good corner. Uh, and someone that if you watch his game, you have to respect. Uh, and honestly, he is better than Kobe outside of deep speed. Kobe does have him beat there. Uh, particularly, and then Kobe also does have a really prototypical frame uh, for a corner. He's got really long arms and he's fairly tall as well. Uh, but Melo Dotson is a, a very talented corner in his own right. They're just very, very, very different corners. Uh, so it's kind of funny to see them in the same secondary because uh, their styles are quite different. Yeah. They, like you said, they could not be more different stylistically. And Melo Dotson has only been penalized once. And I think he may have been penalized a grand total of maybe two or three times in his career. And some of those times I genuinely believe that they called the wrong number by mistake. So Melo Dotson, really, really good sticky cover corner that isn't as good in run support or deep speed, but everything else I think he has Kobe Bryant beat. But there, there is quite literally only one defensive player left worth mentioning on this defense, which, again, tells you about this defense. Yeah, this last one is J.B. Brown, uh, their senior linebacker. Uh, he started out at uh, Bowling Green and uh, has made his way to KU. Uh, he's been here for the last two years. Uh, but... He's uh, been their leading sack getter this year, uh, and he's got one truly elite trait uh, that he mixes in with a bag of kind of average traits, um, and that's that he is a fantastic blitzer. He is able to work himself into seams and pass rush that a lot of other guys just don't even think of trying, and he's definitely going to have to be tagged wherever he is at on the defensive side of the ball uh, because he, he is an immensely talented pass rusher. Uh, and we're going to have to keep our eyes on him at all costs. He He's sort of a mix, but well, actually he's just kind of Austin Romaine, but <laughs> like he, which Austin Romaine is a pretty good linebacker whose best trait is his ability to blitz and be a pass rusher from the middle linebacker position. Uh, it, they're very, very similar players. I think that JB Brown is more creative than Austin Romaine and Austin Romaine is just a little bit more athletic and a bit stronger, but they're pretty comparable players when it comes to just their general acumen and skill in how they play defense. But the TLDR for the defense is their fatal flaw is their front seven, which has exactly one notable player and then the back end of their team has two really good players, one guy that's sort of okay, and then a bunch of just guys. And that's especially when you're in a 4-2, which demands a lot of your linebackers and a lot of your safeties. You cannot have a defense that consists of just guys. And th that's why, to me, the red zone numbers are such a big question mark that I can't, I, I having watched a few of their games, I still can't really explain 
because it, it, it just seems like the other team has a tendency to stall out. And I know that may sound diminutive to KU, but this is more or less me saying I have no idea why they're effective in the red zone. I just know that they are, which, if anything, is a bigger compliment than I think I've given just about any other team. <laughs> I can't explain them. <laughs> But I think the now we can start going into stories to watch going into this game. And of course, the big one, and let, let's let's just be frank with one another. This is KU's I hate using this phrase, but I feel like it is true. This is in all likelihood KU's Super Bowl because they don't they aren't exactly playing for a whole lot more. We have likely been their focus. For, for quite some time. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, and I agree, I don't really like that uh, term. Um, and I imagine coaches hate it even more uh, because coaches hate giving even the slightest indication that they care about one game more than another. Uh, they are practically allergic to it. But the uh, KU's season is just not going the way that they had hoped. Um, but a win against KC could not only just be a big, uh, like a big win for them. It can probably kind of turn the tide uh, in the fan base as well, because there has been kind of a general uh, malaise and uh, um, just a uh, indifference um, from their fan base, uh, particularly um, as the losing streak continued. Um, but. They, uh, this is a big opportunity for this KU game to maybe right the ship. Like, this could be a huge momentum building win. So they're going to be throwing probably about everything they have uh, into this win to try and regain uh, the locker room and the fan base and the coaches and just give everybody a little bit more energy. Uh, like, like last year, I mean, it was clear that uh, they, they really pulled out every stop that they had. Uh, to try and be a K State, and there really was a point in that game where they probably deserved it a lot more than K State did. Um, but uh, this year, I mean, the season has gone drastically different than they were expecting and hoping for. Uh, but this is a great opportunity for them uh, to get things turned around and try and right the ship before it's too late. Yeah, and I I think it a small part of writing the ship would be the extra satisfaction of knowing that they de facto eliminated us from big 12 title contention. Yeah. uh, That's another concern too, for, for our end is, you know, like uh, like whether we want to say it or not, there is a little extra pressure every week because, uh, because we lost at BYU, like until BYU and Iowa state start losing, we have to win every game that's in front of us. Uh, So like, our margin of error is very slim until BYU and Iowa state let us back into it on purpose. So (laughs) we're going to have to wait and see on that, but uh, no, like there, like there, there's a lot that is on the line uh, for, for KU and it's early enough in the season that can still uh, be making arguments for things like bowl games. I mean, they won this game, they're three and five and that's not an unachievable uh, record to make it to a bowl game. I mean, K state is, made it to bowls from pretty similar records in the past. Like, I mean, K-State made a bowl game in 2015, and they were three and six at one point. They won out to go play a meaningless bowl game in Memphis. So uh, <laughs> then that might mean a lot to them because, uh, I mean, it's like they haven't – they got to build a tradition somehow. And it starts with things that maybe a lot of other schools would kind of overlook. Yep. And I, I think the last most notable – part of of this is what KU lacks in the trenches they definitely make up for in the skill positions so especially KU's offense against K-State's defense I like how does excuse me I have the hiccups apparently how does K-State adjust to the the size of the receivers on the outside for KU I think it's an interesting question and um, it's definitely something to keep an eye on uh, because uh, K State uh, really, for as long as I can remember, has sometimes struggled a little bit with your more physical receivers. And 
I imagine we'll probably um, either just run base, and if we have anybody uh, tracking anyone, it's probably going to be Parrish on Grimm, if I had to guess. Uh, but beyond that, like I, I'm not really sure what the coverage strategy is, um, play in, play out, because uh, I do have three guys that can beat us uh, at any given point. Uh, so it, it's going to be um, difficult to watch and difficult to manage, uh, but a, a key part of it's going to be not only getting pressure on Jalen Daniels, but containing him in the pocket because the last thing we want to do is bring a ton of pressure and then have him uh, break and tame. Like yeah. That, the, I mean, that's a, a potential nightmare. So, yep. Especially given how the quarterback run game was used last year, which was still terrifying. But so now we can move into offensive and defensive MVPs. I'll take offensive first this time. And I'm not going to just give it to the offensive line, but I am going to give it to another Kansas player because it would almost feel wrong if I didn't. I'm going to give it to DJ Giddens because they're, we're going to bring back an old joke. The KU run defense has been, um, how do you say, porous. So I, I think that this is another really good opportunity for DJ to have a bounce back game. And I, I think that as much as DJ is capable of wanting something outside of going and fishing, I think that he probably wants the opportunity to have another big time performance. And I think he's more than capable of it, given the weakness of the front seven of KU. Yeah, I've been racking my brain trying to think of somebody else uh, that I could mention. And I'm kind of struggling. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say Dylan Edwards, but I think I'm just going to double up with you and say DJ Giddens as well. I think that he he's probably gearing up for a really big game, unless KU just completely sells out on the run. But honestly, I don't think they have the front seven uh, that's good enough to do that. Uh, West Virginia, like their the majority of their defensive talent was situated in their front seven, uh, so other than Aubrey Burks, but. KU does not have the same level of talent. Um, and where they do have some talent in that group, uh, like with J.B. Brown, he's um, more skilled at creating a pass rush as opposed to being a run stopper, uh, which, you know, it's more than just running at the line. So, like, those two skills aren't completely transferable. Uh, but that's uh, I, I think I have to go with D.J. Giddens as well because I, I think we're going to really rely on him. Um, this game. I, I think that we would prefer to be a run first team, even though we went air raid against West Virginia. I, I don't think that was our preference. Yeah. But you get, you get defensive pick now. Yeah. Defensively. Uh, one of the keys is going to be uh, getting to Brendan Mott. I've said it before, uh, or to Jalen Daniels. And so that's why I'm picking Brendan Mott. And <laughs> uh, Brendan Mott, he's got seven sacks on the year. Uh, I mean, he, right now he's on pace to, like tie or break the K State single season sack record, which is just absolutely nuts. I mean, he uh, definitely didn't have the year that we were hoping he would last year. Uh, but I think with a deeper uh, defensive end room, that's really helped him uh, because we've got a more consistent pass rush uh, at other places. And I think also maybe we were just really underrating him because uh, uh, he's he's really been kind of a revelation this year. Uh, he's been one of the uh, he's been the best. He's been the best pass rusher that we've had since Felix, and which is nuts. Yeah, which is absolutely absurd. I mean, I guess it wasn't that long ago, but it, it is pretty crazy to me that Brendan Ma is kind of like in terms of sack production, maybe not necessarily talent, but production wise, he is in that same tier as Felix. So, like, first round pick. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's a uh, weird it's, world. It really is strange. Um, but I, I'm I'm picking Brendan Mott. I I think we're gonna need him to get some level of consistent pressure in the backfield. I'm actually gonna go with Des Purnell because I think that and it's not just because he's the another Kansas guy, because if I were just picking based of purely off of vibes of can Kansas guy, it would almost certainly be Austin Moore. But Des Purnell blends the has the perfect skill set to kind of stop the play action defense that or offense that KU wants to run 
because he did the exact same thing at Baylor. I don't think people remember how dominant Des Purnell was up against Baylor in particular, but he was a game wrecker every time that he was involved in a Baylor game because he is a very good blitzer who is not going to get fooled by play action. And by that, I mean, oh, no, he's biting forward, but he's going to kill the quarterback anyway. <laughs> like He can be wrong, but he's just going to play so fast that it's not really going to matter. And he's still good enough, a good enough tackler to get out on the wide zones and interrupt, at least force the ball to go back inside to Austin Romaine or Austin Moore. So I'm going to give my pregame defensive MVP to Dez, or my, I suppose, my projected MVP to Dez. But Connor, it's the moment everyone's been waiting for. K State wins if, K State loses if, and what is your projection? Uh, K-State's going to win this game if they uh, prevent um, the KU offense uh, from getting both dimensions working. Uh, We can't let Devin Neal run all over us, and we cannot let the receivers get wide open downfield. If we let both of those things happen, it's going to be a very long night uh, for the K-State defense. Uh, So I think that that is probably going to be the biggest key on this one, is uh, we need to limit them in one way or another. And yeah. then lose, uh, I, I think um, that we're going to lose if we let KU shut down um, K-State's run game. Uh, I think if we can't get the run game going, uh, kind of like the first half uh, against West Virginia, I think the consequences might be a little bit more uh, than they were against the Mountaineers because uh, KU does have a more talented secondary uh, than West Virginia. And I think that... Uh, we can probably still throw the ball against them, but maybe not with as much ease as we did against West Virginia. Cause we really like, if we wanted to throw the ball in a particular place, there was a really good chance that it was going to happen no matter what. Uh, so I don't think we'll be able to uh, change, uh, change uh, our trajectory as quickly as we did uh, um, with the past game, like we did against West Virginia. Um, so I can going to have to find a way to stop the run. I think if they want to win this game. And what's well, we'll do projections afterwards. But for me, K State wins this game if they're able to do two things. First is get their own running game established, which I think they're more than capable of doing up against this KU front seven. And I think the other part is to just have to play disciplined d- defense from specifically the linebackers. You can't have players like Austin Romaine, and I'm mo- I'm mostly talking about Austin Romaine going rogue. And as soon as he sees the semblance of a play fake, he's immediately going to charge after what he thinks is the ball carrier. But that also applies a little bit to the jack safety as well. So don't ideally you don't let them get the running game established so that the play action game isn't a threat at all. I don't think Devin Neal is going to let that happen. So you just need to be very disciplined on the back end when it comes to staying in your zone or staying to your man and playing deep whenever they run the play fakes. And to me, K-State loses this game if they let KU mount momentum. If K-State comes out and scores on the first two drives – I think that KU is going to either do one of two things, lay down and die, or get into panic mode. I think the second one is way more likely. And we've seen Jalen Daniels in panic mode before, and he's even worse there. (laughs) He goes from okay to stinky very, very quickly when he's put into panic mode and has to play from behind. So... If KU is able to jump on K-State early and get – honestly, I think that the team that gets to 10 points faster probably wins this game. And I I don't think that this is a game that's going to have a lot in the way of comebacks. I think it's either going to be a close KU victory, which I think is much less likely than the alternative, which is my prediction for the score. As much as I've been talking up this KU team – I don't think that they're on the same level as K-State, mostly schematically. So I'm projecting a big 
Wildcat victory. I'm projecting 49 to 14 in favor of K-State. I have a somewhat similar score. I'm rolling with K-State 45, KU 21. I, I'm thinking that I think this game is just too important. Every game is too important, really, down the stretch for K-State. And uh, I, I think that the biggest thing maybe that we can draw from last week is that Avery is capable of succeeding in multiple different ways. Um, he didn't run the ball a single time last week. I bet we would like to do that again, honestly, if we could afford it. And I, I think Avery probably ends up having, uh, I'll say, uh, um, four or fewer uh, runs in this game, whether designed or scrambles, not including sacks. But he won't be sacked, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> You have any any final notes before we we sign off? I'm kind of glad this is a night game. I feel like for a long time, uh, KCKU was like 11 a.m. or 2:30, and like on ESPN Plus. Uh, I, I like a night game in October, uh, so I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's it's going to be a ton of fun. Yeah, I I also am looking forward to this game, but there there always will be the nerves about the game, especially because I feel like I despise KU more than most people on earth. So the, the idea of just the, the 1% possibility of losing the KU is, is debilitating to me. And some people might say rent free to which my response is that's a really bad argument to say to someone who just hates you that much. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the game. And for the record, I, I think that KU's chances of winning this game sit between 10 and 15%, which granted that was about the same odds that I gave BYU. So <laughs> I, let's hope we're not heading towards that road. But with that said, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us just about anywhere at Aggieville A Cats. And if you want to email us, we're Aggieville Alley Cats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edward 00. I am at Connor Baltzor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store and the supporters link both found in our podcast and Twitter bios. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. We're come rain, shine, or anything in between. We're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.